Hi everyone, uh, thank you so much for coming. So, uh, we're really, really happy to have you all here, especially with uh, Mr. Rupert Schofield with us. So as you all know, uh, Rupert is the CEO and founder of Finca International, one of the largest microfinance organizations around the world. Uh, they currently have over $1 billion of microloans under the management. They have served over a million clients across over 22 countries. So really, really happy uh, to have Rupert here with us. So without further ado, let's give a big round of applause to Mr. Rupert Schofield. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So hi, everyone. Uh, it's good to be back in London. I guess you guys are the next wave of geniuses that are going to put the world right. Is that right? <laughs> All right. So uh, what I'll do for, uh, for you tonight is kind of recount my uh, experience becoming a social entrepreneur, um, <clears throat> and uh, I've modestly entitled it The Hero's Journey. <clears throat> <clears throat> so let's, let's pick up The Hero. It was 1971, and uh, I was facing a really difficult decision. Because <clears throat> you see, in 1971, the Vietnam War was at its height, and I was 20, two years old, I was not only eligible for the draft, but I was in a category they called 1A, which meant there was basically a 100% chance I was going to be drafted and sent to Vietnam. Or I could go to Canada, but it's kind of cold and you know, not the kind of place I'd want to spend the rest of my life and never see my family again. So I didn't want to do that. <clears throat> I could go to jail. Uh, a number of my classmates did that. Uh, between jail and Canada, hmm, that was a tough one. <laughs> uh, so there it was, Vietnam, Canada, jail. <clears throat> but then it turned out there was a fourth option, which I was not even aware of, but somebody told me about, the Peace Corps. Now the Peace Corps didn't mean you got out of uh, Vietnam. It just meant you got a two-year deferment and you went to some foreign country and uh, I didn't know what you did there but you know I understood you went there and you lived among the people and you did something nice. Um, but uh, uh, you know I could still be drafted after I got back but hey anything can happen in two years right? So, off I go, we went to Mexico, in two months I learned Spanish, went to Costa Rica, two months I learned how to be a farmer in Costa Rica, and they sent me to uh, this beautiful little town in Guatemala, San Martin Hilotepeque, tropical paradise, you know, I had views of active volcanoes, um, and I, you know, I started walking out to meet the members of this cooperative. And uh, you know, as I'm talking to them and looking at their crops and everything, I realize, wow, I'm uh, I'm going to be more of a threat to their crops than you know any kind of <laughs> advantage. What can I do here to make myself useful? And so uh, what I realized was, well, you know, we couldn't really help them much with the co-op unless we gave them credit, you know, because they. After years of working the land, the soil had been very depleted of its nutrients and everything. But if we could get them a few bags of fertilizer, we could greatly increase the yields. So uh, we set up this cooperative and we uh, decided we'd make them $50 loans and you know they would pay us back when the crop was ready. Um, so. Um, I started going out and promoting it, and before long I had like 800 uh, people who signed up. And so I took this big list of the names, I went around to all the stores. Hey, you ever, this guy ever take credit from you? No, no, he's, you know, well, yeah, that guy did, he paid. Oh, whoa, not that guy, you know. So the 800 people got a loan, and, uh, you know, a, a number of things struck me about this experience. The first thing was, was that you know, when they started to work the crops and they put the fertilizer on, the, the yields were dramatic. They were like triple, quadruple what they used to obtain. And uh, by the time the, uh, you know, and that had a, a number of enormous benefits. You know, they, uh, 
they could eat better, they had a marketable surplus for the first time, so they could they had money to buy medicine and you know and clothing for their kids. I mean the impact was just dramatic, you know, just from this fifty dollars. And uh, the other thing that struck me was, of the eight hundred people, um, seven hundred and ninety nine of them paid me back in full, a hundred percent, you know, with twelve percent interest. And the third thing really came later, you know. Uh, well, actually, there, were, there was a wonderful event. After a year, uh, there was an end to the draft. So I was a free man. My gamble had worked out. So I could go back to the States and continue my life. When I, when I told them I was leaving, their reaction just stunned me. You know, they, this one guy just blew said, Rupert, you can't go. You know, I said, oh, don't worry about it. You know, another gringo will come and replace me. You know, he said, no, 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 you can't go. And he literally grabbed my hand, you know, as if to prevent me from leaving. He started weeping, you know. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, I thought, wow, for the first time in my life, I made a difference in other people's lives. And that was it, you know. That's why I'm here today, <clears throat> you know. I mean, that was the experience that hooked me. <clears throat> okay, so it's 1973. Our hero gets on a plane. He flies back to New York to resume his life. Um, so this was the scene in New York in 1973. <clears throat> Basically, there was high unemployment. Nobody was hiring. You know, I'm walking around. What can I do? People interview me, so what can you do? I said, well, you know, I can make $50 loans to campesinos in the highlands of Guatemala. Oh, good, okay, well, we'll call you, you know. So months go by, nothing's happening, you know. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm running out of money. I think the Peace Corps gave me a severance package of, of $1,000 or something like that. I felt kind of like a prisoner, you know, when you get your money. You, you know, go off, join the rest of society, you know, live your life. And uh, so I, uh, money was running out, and uh, I thought, what can I do? I've got to be, have something I can offer. So I thought, okay, I can speak Spanish. That's probably the only thing I can do. So I start calling up tutoring agencies, and I call up this one place. I went out to schools, you know, and I remember the last gig I did, and I was standing before a group like this, and I'm pitching the Eastern School for Physicians' Aids, you know. And, uh, you know, all the students are looking at me like bored out of their skulls, like, who is this guy, you know. And I literally, I got so frustrated, I started weeping with frustration, you know, <clears throat> and because and, I knew I was a total failure at this. And uh, so this this teacher comes and takes pity on me and says, you know, it says you were in the Peace Corps. <clears throat> you know, why don't you tell the students about that? You know, so I started talking about my uh, experience in the Peace Corps and all the enthusiasm came back, you know, and I realized, well, I've got to get back to that, you know. So now what? Let's pick up our hero again. Um, so I go back to graduate school. University of Wisconsin. Okay, now I'm getting somewhere, right? I do a double master's in two years, public policy and administration and agricultural economics. <clears throat> so start interviewing for jobs. Um, I go to uh, the Minnesota Bank for Cooperatives, you know, and I get to the very last, it's between me and somebody else, you know, and uh, the guy says, so Rupert, are you excited about this job? And I go, <sighs> you know? And I, you know, I just couldn't fake it. It happened over and over. I'd get to the last interview, you know? I was, I was trying to stay in the States and lead a normal life. And, uh, you know, it just wasn't working. So now I have, uh, I'm married, I have a baby on the way, and I'm about to graduate and I have no job. You know, so I'm thinking, wow, what have I done wrong, you know? <clears throat> and so I'm disconsolately walking through the student union, and I suddenly see this thing on the bulletin board, and it says, looking for ex-Peace Corps volunteers who speak Spanish 
and can write for a consulting firm. And I go, he's looking for me, you know? So I, you know, polish up my resume for the thousandth time, send it off, no real hope. And uh, a week later, I get a letter back. I open it up, and uh, there's a check for $1,500 and a plane ticket to the Dominican Republic and a yellow post-it saying, you're hired, meet me in Santo Domingo. <coughs> John Hatch. So who is this guy? You know, I mean, he never interviewed me. What is going on here? John Hatch, many years later, turns out to be the guy who uh, co-founds Finca with me. But uh, anyway, that, that was sort of the, the story of, of letting your passion carry you, trying to resist it somehow. But if you know it's the right thing for you to do, then, you know, <clears throat> trust it, give in to it. So anyway, I don't know how many of you know how, uh, you know, microfinance works. How many of you know how microfinance works? It's, it's basically micro, it's basically about making small loans to entrepreneurs, uh, usually in developing countries, although it does happen here in the UK and in the US, but it's very simple. It's sort of like, it works sort of like the opposite of banking, you know. Regular banking is you get a lot of deposits from people and then you make, you know, a lot, a lot of bigger loans and you try to, you know, have the smallest possible uh, cost of funds and the smallest possible cost of administration. But in microfinance, it's usually making very small loans and having a rather large cost of operations because you have to pay people to go out and make the, uh, make the loans and so forth. Pretty much what I did in the Peace Corps. Um, so uh, anyway, uh, I had done some stuff after uh, graduate school. I, I, I did the consulting gig with John Hatch. He was just starting out his firm. He said, I'll give you all the work you want, you know, and turns out he could barely get enough work for himself. So I had to go out off on my own and do some consulting. And I eventually got another job for about six years uh, working with unions in Latin America. That's a whole nother story. But then John and I got back together uh, and he described the idea to me and it's called village banking. And uh, you know, this is just a schematic of how Finko would prime the pump, so to speak, into something called a village bank, which was like a cooperative. And everybody would get $50 and it was always around groups of women. Uh, and we worked with women for a number of reasons. One because they were more responsible than the men, frankly. Uh, and they would take the uh, profits from their businesses and they would invest them in the family. You know, that woman there holding the child, what her mindset is, is that my parents were poor, I'm poor, but damn it, if I can do anything about it, my child is not gonna grow up poor. You know, so she'll invest everything in that child to get him educated, well-fed, clothed, healthy. You know, that's her goal, you know, and that's what we tapped into. And that's why, you know, microfinance and our form of it called village banking was so incredibly powerful because we were putting resources into the hands of these women and they were starting these small businesses. So John, you know, he explains this idea and everything, and he says, we're gonna raise the money. I said, well, how long is that gonna take? And he said, oh, probably six months, you know. So six years later, we're trying to raise money. We're not very good at it. And this, this is the experience of every entrepreneur who ever lived, right? Even though, like today, people say, microfinance, oh yeah, you know, like, reaches hundreds of millions of people. There's arguments, you know, about, you know, how, uh, how effective it is. Does it really get people out of poverty? There's arguments about how ethical it is. You know, the interest rates tend to be high, and we'll talk about those. But in the old days, <clears throat> you know, 
uh, that wasn't, those were not the issues. The issues we had then was people didn't believe poor people could pay back loans. They didn't believe they could save. They didn't believe they could pay interest. Um, so we had an enormously difficult time explaining this to people that this actually worked. You know, nobody believed it. You know, so it took us a long time to uh, raise the money uh, to go into business for ourselves. So in the meantime, what did we do? You know, we had this dynamite idea that we knew from our pilot projects worked. You know, and I knew from my Peace Corps experience it worked. So we said, all right, we don't have money, we don't have people, let's go to those who do. So uh, it just worked brilliantly. We went to Save the Children, Catholic Relief Services. We trained all their people. Uh, and, uh, you know, and we would earn a few consulting fees along the way. But then around the third or fourth visit we made, you know, providing the technical assistance, uh, the same thing kept happening. You know, we'd go in and we'd meet the people. Hey, what are you guys doing here? You know, I'd say, well, we came back, you know, we had the fourth uh, TA thing, you know, here's the contract. Oh, you know what? We've got this figured out. We actually don't need you guys anymore, you know, uh, but thanks a lot. This is terrific. And, you know, and John would go, great, you know? And I'd be thinking, great, you know? How are we gonna make a living, you know? They don't need us anymore. <laughs> so, so I said, so John and I would get into these big arguments. I did, John, you know, this is so good. Let's start trading for our own account, you know? Let's stop teaching the rest of the world how to live it. We've done that, you know? We've done the proof of concept. Now we can go out there and raise money ourselves. After all, we invented this thing. Let's do it, you know? So ultimately, uh, you know, we had a board of directors by now, and uh, John had an older brother who was actually out of corporate America, Fortune 500 CEO, and he kind of got it and said, yeah, you know, John, we got to do this for, for ourselves. So we started to create our own Fink uh, affiliates around the world. <clears throat> and we started out uh, with a whopping $40,000 in capital. We hired in four Central American countries, Costa Rica, Guatemala, El Salvador, and Honduras. We hired a woman entrepreneur uh, never a banker, never even, you know, really any, anyone with any kind of financial training, just a woman who, you know, was somebody who wanted to start a business, had some managerial skills. You know, we pay, I think we pay them the princely sum of $500 a month, and we put the manual in their hands, and we gave them 10,000 bucks, and we said, go create four village banks, go, what are you doing here, you know? So they would go out, sometimes they would be really scared the first time, like, ugh, but then when they saw it worked, you know, they, uh, they just, you know, it took off and they would bring donors to come look at it and the donors would be impressed and, you know, this was something everybody wanted to, to fund. Now, again, were we just lucky? Did we hire the right people? I, I think basically it was the power of a stupendous revolutionary idea that made it almost foolproof and made it, in, uh, made it invulnerable to even the worst uh, mistakes that we made. And we did make zillions of mistakes. I'm gonna kind of fast forward to this stuff. Uh, we work now, um, since you know, we, we piloted this idea in 1984 in Latin America, we went to Africa, after that we went to Eurasia, then the Middle East and South Asia finally. We now have a number of uh, financial institutions, banks, uh, finance companies. You know, we kind of evolved out of doing it through, through NGOs. Um, we have, um, you know, financially we started out funding it with donations, then we leveraged it with commercial debt, 
in the countries where we work. And the last stage uh, has been, we are now looking at other social enterprises that we can tap on to this uh, powerful financial services empire. Um, we're also experimenting with reaching the absolute poorest people, people who are too poor, destitute, can't afford even to take loans or pay back loans. We're making them small grants. We're working in healthcare and health insurance. We're piloting a green energy uh, initiative in Uganda. And we're looking at other areas like, like uh, education and, and so forth. So I think I'm going to leave you with this thought. Um, you know, if you're interested in this area, I think it is the next huge thing. I think all enterprises will eventually be social enterprises for a number of reasons. One, because people like yourselves, I think, you know, you don't want to work for a company that's doing bad, you know, damaging the environment or something like that, or cheating people, treating them unethically. I mean, uh, at least, you know, the young people I'm meeting and bringing into Finca, they're coming to Finca because, you know, they want to have some meaning in what they're doing. They want to feel good about what they do every day. You know, they're looking not just to make a living. And incidentally, if you come up with a great idea for a social enterprise, you can make a damn good living, you know? I never thought I could, you know? But I'm doing fine, you know, as are many other people financially. I never ever set out with that as a goal, but, you know, as when you build an organization that, you, I mean, I've delivered 80 plus quarters of growth, you know? And it's not because I'm a genius, <laughs> you know? Although maybe I am, I don't know. You know, you, you decide, you be the judge. But, no, I mean, no, because I've tapped into an area of enormous need, you know, and we're still not remotely close to meeting the demands of, of the people we're trying to work with. So, um, I think this is an enormously exciting space. I think it's the future. Uh, we certainly need bright young people like you to come in and, and help you know, uh, develop this space. It's limited only by, you know, our, our imagination as human beings. Um, if I could kind of give you a, a final thought on that whole thing of finding your passion and, uh, you know, connecting with the people you're trying to help. The best way to do that is, is, you know, whether it's here domestically or overseas, live with them, you know, talk to them, understand what they need, and, uh, you know, follow your dream. So thank you very much. <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat>
Uh, but we never had to. It, it worked just the same as Latin America. You know, yeah, we, you have, we built up in, in Uganda, you know, we have a, a network of uh, regional offices, and each regional office has credit officers, you know, who get around either on motorcycles or buses or taxis or whatever. So, uh, you know, they, these are the challenges that are, are not difficult. And the, and the government, I have to say, has been very supportive, probably one of the most supportive governments, not only in Africa, but the whole world, you know. I mean, they really created an enabling regulatory framework. They're, like, they, they created a special uh, entity for microfinance called a microfinance deposit-taking uh, company which has a smaller minimum capital than a regular commercial bank, and it doesn't have as much regulation, you know, and it, and it allows us to lend without collateral. So I would say they've been tremendously supportive. Really. Do you see a special chance in the current market environment um, because of low interest rates that people are less interested in traditional investments but more interested in, like, social investments? I, you know, I think... Um, you know, the smarter companies now, even the big ones, are all going this way. Probably the best, the best example is Unilever, you know. If you talk to Unilever now, I mean, you, you probably know the term corporate social responsibility, right? CSR. And that was typically like, okay, I'm a company, I'm a profit maximizer, but in order to have good PR, uh, and not take flack from the media and shareholder, you know, activist shareholders. I'm going to do some neat little stuff. Maybe I'll lend, maybe I'll make a grant to Finca for ten thousand dollars and get photos and pictures. But the smarter, more progressive companies are saying, you know what? We don't. We're not going to have a CSR program. We are responsible. The entire operation is responsible, and everything we do is not going to harm anything, not going to harm the environment. It's going to be done ethically. We're still going to make money, hopefully scads of money, you know. But people are going to do business with us because we're responsible, you know. And you know the whole things like you walk down the street and have a cup of coffee and it's free trade coffee, you know, and that presumably the growers get a fair price for it, you know, the traders don't rip them off. Um, so uh, I think that these are powerful drivers, you know, and people, people even want to, uh, they want to know how the animals they eat are treated, you know, while they're being fattened and even when they're slaughtered. I don't know how they do that, but, uh, you know, I think this whole, uh, the whole trend, people have, have figured out this is actually good for business, you know? I mean, acting responsibly and being a good corporate citizen is, is good business, and we're gonna get more of the customers. So there's a ton of exciting stuff going on. And I'm, you know, I should be retiring, and my board keeps asking me about succession planning, and I tell them I'm following the African model, I'm president for life. You know, <laughs> sorry, I'm not going anywhere. I'm joking. But uh, no, they, uh, <clears throat> they want me to think about, you know, succession, but I want to think about reinventing Finca and being an entrepreneur again, you know? Because I promise you, it's incredibly hard work, but there's nothing as much fun, nothing as much fun as, you know, getting a gang of your buddies together and getting around an idea and, you know, launching a business. It's the most exciting thing on earth and the most fun thing on earth and the most satisfying thing on earth. And that sounds like a rap line to me. <laughs> Thanks a lot, you guys.